Good morning, everybody. Hope you're having a great week in Philadelphia. We've had great, amazing weather uh, that we've been enjoying. And I hope in other parts of the country and the world that you who are watching this today are also having great weather and enjoying it. And hope you've gotten your shots. I've gotten mine after this week. I'm good to go. Still wearing the mask, but I get to go and enjoy a lot of good stuff now that is starting to open up in Philadelphia. So thrilled about that. So let's go with our questions. The first question is from Michael Wielding. Michael asks, I have a ticket sales website currently in Canada. How can I get things back to normal? I need to be able to communicate with our clients and see how we can help them. Are there programs specific to the events industry that we can take advantage of or help promoters take advantage of? to help everyone through COVID? Are there programming changes we need to do to help accommodate this? I have a ticket sales website similar to Ticketmaster with COVID ticket sales have plummeted. I have to see how I can better serve my clients. So I'm sorry to hear that, Michael, but there's not a lot that can be done until people are actually willing to do events, unless you're getting exclusive online events that people are willing to pay for. So clearly, if Mark Zuckerberg were willing to come out there and spend money, I mean, willing to go and speak, and a group had him as a speaker, I'm sure people would be more than willing to pay for that. So maybe if you go out and target organizations who have high-end speakers, that they would want other people besides even the convention people to sign up that would like to go and hear that person speak and pay for it, maybe that's an opportunity for you. But I guess right now, the best that you can possibly do is help your clients who've run events with you in the past communicate what's going to happen in the future. When will live events start taking a place? How will they start taking place? And maybe you could even go to your past live event customers and give suggestions about, if you aren't already doing it, about how they could go and make money by selling their events online. I'm a member of the Philadelphia Pops. I'm a season ticket holder for them in Philadelphia. And I have to say that I probably would have been glad to pay part of my season ticket package to see them do events that I could watch exclusively online on my big screen TV. I think that would have been uh, great to go and do. So I think depending on what the event is, people are willing to pay clearly uh, Hollywood has seen that people are willing to pay almost ticket uh, inside theater ticket prices to watch something at home if, it, if it's something that really interests them. So I kind of think that maybe you're going to have to even thinking about adjusting your model even for the future, because I hate to say this, but I don't think what we went through with COVID will be the last time we see that. I don't think it's a once every hundred year event i think we'll start to see these things cropping up and again we're all having to adjust to it hence why we've all gotten used to zoom and zoom's become a verb like google so you're going to need to do some adjusting to it but unfortunately a lot of this stuff is out of your control the next question is from Lori, uh lauren uh i think it's sinex i hope i pronounced that name correctly question is what items should I make sure to include in a partnership agreement? Does AO have a template? I am opening an Etsy store and my partner and I have verbally agreed on things and are working on a written agreement. The first thing I would do if I were you, and I've had this experience before working with partners, is I would write down in writing who's responsible for what, how much each of you are being compensated for, and if someone's unhappy, how do you go and deal with that? So right now, you're probably each owning 50%. But what happens when you can't come to an agreement on this? So you're going to need to maybe get a third person. So what I would do first before I went to lawyers is write out everything. Who's responsible for what? Who's investing what money? How much equity each person has? Because you might be the one who's putting up all the money and, and therefore you're deciding what the terms are going to go and be. So you might say, well, if I'm putting up all the money, I'm going to own 60, 80% of the company. And that pretty much settles it. But what it doesn't settle is what if you're not happy with your partner and how do you go at, about buying out their stock and 
value in the company, which is what a, where a lawyer is going to come in. But the first thing you need to do is write it out in a Google Doc or Word document, what you two are responsible for, compensation, how you're going to handle disagreements. And then once you've agreed to that, then go to the lawyer in your state because every state has different laws and then ask a lawyer to put together an agreement that you both are willing to sign. Our next question comes from Zach Nock. Zach asks, how do you start a training program for employees? What are the bare bones structure needed for a successful program? My company, Diamond State Technology, specializes in working with access control, cameras, automation, and security systems for both residential and commercial applications. The reason I'm asking this question is I'm growing rapidly. I need guidance on how to build a six-month training program for my technicians. Well, what I would do if I were you is I would write out all the steps that need to happen when you are actually installing these products. So if, if your technicians are just people installing, then you might develop a process that you know has worked for you that's very efficient, it works well, and it leaves little chance for anything going wrong. So I would write all of that out. And then I might ask someone to take uh, my camera and videotape this and you walk somebody through every part of it. So that way you have it on video, you have it in writing, and then you go and test it out on someone and see where the holes are and make sure that everything runs smoothly. So you need to go and write everything out first. Again, I like the idea of doing the video so you can see if there's anything wrong. And I'd also go watch videos online, but I wouldn't make it too complicated, but I would make it detailed enough that every step is covered. And then once you've done that, I would go and train the first person and ask them, or you'll be able to see here's what was missing and you'll get better and better at it to the point that you've perfected it totally. And the only person that can really do this initially is you yourself writing everything out in advance and having uh, yourself see all the different um, parts to what you do. And if you have salespeople, you have to train them, then that's a whole different group that you're training because then you're training them on what kinds of questions uh, that will be asked of them, how to go and answer those questions. Um, and then they would have to go out in jobs and see how the jobs are actually done and, and assist someone in installing so they understand the whole process themselves. And again, once you've written all this out, you filmed it, then you're of course going to take people out with you and you're going to go out with them a few times until they've mastered it and then they can be on their own and send them out to do uh, the work themselves. Nancy Lopez asked, what business sales, branding, and preparation do I need for my business before I start trying to sell my product to wholesalers? I make jewelry. I want to sell it online and through other boutiques. What do I need to have already before I start contacting them? Congratulations on your new venture. What I would suggest you do is create a website and you can go to uh, Wix or any of the, or GoDaddy and create a first version website of your product and show all the different pieces that you have. And then go and show friends this website and get feedback on it. And, and there's so many easy templated sites to go use. I would start with a first version site until you start really bringing in money. And then if you want to improve your site, you can either have someone develop it uh, for you, and there's, it's not that expensive anymore to develop these things, or you could go and continue to learn and develop the skills yourself. So first thing you want to do is get that website up so people can see it. Second thing you want to do is have a Facebook um, presence because jewelry is sold to consumers and Facebook is great for consumers. You'd want to have a LinkedIn presence for your business because you're going to go and try to get other businesses uh, to sell your products. So you're going to do that. You're going to probably next uh, go on to different sites like Amazon and start a store on Amazon and be able to go and sell those products. 
but I would initially start with your own site, marketing to friends, family, and asking them to get the word out and see what the response is to your jewelry. If the pricing is right, if the pictures are good, if in fact how you're describing them is good, and if you have the right offering that's going out there and who is the right recipient of the kind of jewelry that you have. Is it low cost? Is it high expensive jewelry? Who's the target market for your jewelry? How much are people gonna have to spend on the product that you've developed? So knowing that is also going to determine where you're gonna set up shop and also it's going to determine what the look and feel of your website is. Because if you're selling lower end, you still want it to look nice, but you may want it to be simple. You don't want people to get the impression they want it to, you, you want them to get the impression that it's quality, but it's not uh, it's not unaffordable for them. Or if you're going to a higher end and you're building unique things, then you want people to feel like this it is an honor to get your artistic work and have it uh, on their uh, wrist or their fingers or their ears or wherever they're going to go and put uh, the jewelry you develop, but you want them to feel like this is really special, one of a kind, and you might be charging that kind of money that shows that it's one of a kind. So again, you're starting with that website, you're uh, having a LinkedIn page, a Facebook page, and probably you're going to need business cards at some point because as COVID is dying down, um, then you are being able to uh, give those cards out and meet people. But in the beginning, I'm sure you're going to be selling online. And who you're hearing and giving advice to you right now is my English bulldog, Roxy. So excuse me one second. Roxy, shh, come over here. Come on over here. This is, of course, when you do live and you're working from home. This is what you end up getting. So if you can give me a minute, one second, I'm going to grab, give her some treats. And I'm sure all of you who have dogs can appreciate this. Well, Roxy now has her treat, so I think we're in good shape. So our next question comes from Morgan Katz. Morgan asks, what strategies do you use to build your network? I work with companies to help them maintain their season ticket tickets to concert venues, sports teams. I'm very active on LinkedIn and in person networking events prior to COVID, but looking for new options to add in. I'm looking for ways you used uh, networking groups or associations to develop more relationships or even get more buy-in with large customers. The elevator pitch is, we fill gaps in corporate event ticketing by helping companies manage their season and event tickets. We keep them compliant, provide trackable data while easing the process of season ticket management. So, you're trying to uh, both work with getting more people who would provide you with the opportunity to sell their tickets, but you also want to interact with customers to uh, drive them to your clients sites to buy the tickets. One of the things that I think you might do is maybe you would set up a podcast where you're interviewing people uh, who run these different events to talk about the up and coming events and what it's like to plan their events and and what it was like to deal with different people. And having that podcast out there might attract other potential buyers of your services because they would like to be on your podcast and you start to develop a relationship. And you can market that podcast out through Facebook, LinkedIn. Uh, you can go and actually buy names and email out to those people. But friends, family, and, and your business associates, if you have a compelling podcast that people like to listen to, you'll see it will pick up. I create a podcast called The Best Business Minds. I interview business book authors every Friday. And I've now grown in one year where I've interviewed 60 authors to where people in 38 countries are now listening every Friday to these interviews. 
And that's opened up a lot of doors and has improved my network. In fact, I've picked up 1,400 new contacts in one year just having this particular podcast. So I think a podcast would be good. I think also writing online columns like 10 ways to increase your audience would be a good way for you to come across as an expert. So post that on LinkedIn, post that on a line and other business related uh, sites. And I think between the podcast and the posting content, I think all that would be good. And then you can also join meetup groups. Now, I haven't found the, uh, the groups on LinkedIn to be very good. In fact, I'm in like 50 groups representing over 3 million people. And when I posted things on those um, different uh, LinkedIn groups, I have found basically zero response to them. And I've had amazing speakers uh, on my program, John Chambers, who was the uh, chairman CEO of Cisco Systems, an icon in the technology world, well-known uh, nationally to even people who aren't from the technology world and some other folks that I thought for those industry groups, because I was focusing on technology and startups and angel investors, that out of 3 million, certainly I'd probably get probably even a thousand out of 3 million who would want to sign up. And I basically saw nobody was interested. Well, when I posted on my own LinkedIn, which has about 12,000 contacts, I would get anywhere from 200 to 1,000 people who would click on that and then click through uh, to see more. So I think that separating yourself, making yourself as an expert, getting involved um, with different event planners and people who are running events and interviewing them raises their visibility, allows you to develop the contact and makes you appear to be the go-to person and the one with the most knowledge. And writing columns will reinforce that. So that's what I would do if I were you. The next question is from Joe Nugent. What do you suggest as far as paying independent contractors who I contract to help me facilitate providing my services to my customers? I own a home inspection business and I'm turning away five to eight inspections per week. I'm looking to partner with another inspection company, so entrepreneur, who is not as busy so I can make money while working less. How do I, how do, I do the billing? Collect from the client that send to other inspection company, have them collect them and then send me a check? First of all, you want to control this whole thing because you certainly don't want to help build somebody else's business where you stop getting those five to eight extra calls a week that you can't handle. So what I think you might want to do is train somebody who would like to work on a part-time basis who isn't likely to try to go into business for themselves and have them sign a, not a non-compete, uh, but a non-solicitation agreement where they can't go after your your uh, past clients, any of the clients you send them to them or the relationships you have and go train somebody to do them, get them certified or find somebody who has certification, who is great at doing it, but a terrible marketer themselves. And you can run ads saying, if you have this skill set, but hate selling that skill set, I am more than willing to have you work on my behalf with some of my clients, and then whatever they're charging, you might charge 20, 25% more on top of it, or you might say to them, here's what I charge for this. Are you willing to take it minus my 25% uh, fee for sending you the business? And then they can be under your banner and they shouldn't be separate. They should have an email related to your business so they appear to be in your business. And then you have to make sure that they don't work so many hours that they're now considered full-time employees, which I believe is 30 hours. But again, you should check with a lawyer about that to make sure uh, what it is from a federal side and also for your state, because every state has different laws of what's considered full-time work. So again, I would either go and train someone who wants to work part-time, who doesn't have great skills, uh, sales skills, and doesn't want to go out there and sell, but would like to do the work and has a good enough personality when you send them out there, they're professional, 
they present well, they represent you well, or find someone who may be semi-retired or works part-time but is already certified, hates the idea of having to sell themselves but just wants to do the business, and then have them come in under your banner, and then you send them out under you, and then you either um, ha take 25% or 20%, whatever the percentage you want to make on it, and you take that, and that's your money that comes in, and then you take the rest of the um, money and pay them to do it. But again, you don't want to exceed the number of hours where you have to start paying health care benefits and all the other things. Our next question is from Karina Steer, or Steyer, I should, I think it's Steyer. Karina asks, what factors would you take into consideration when deciding between working on your own side hustle uh, versus with your spouse on their business? My husband runs his own videography business that did approximately 250K in 2020. Congratulations, very successful. He has no employees, only contractors, no CRM, does almost all administrative tasks manually. My experience is in administration, operations, management, so fixing these things, setting up systems, and running behind the scenes are all strengths of mine. That being said, working with a spouse seems like it could have additional challenges that I'm not fully aware of. I've worked with my spouse in the past, and that had its good and its bad. Luckily for us, we had complementary skills. I was the outgoing one who likes to go out there and meet the people and bring in the business. She liked doing the back end, which is what it sounds like. You're perfect complement to each other. He absolutely needs what you have to offer. Why go and sell this to someone else? What you need to work out in the beginning is how much control of the decisions he will allow you to go and make and not try to override it with you. So you have to go and put together a document about what you two are going to agree to. So let's say that you want to make a decision on paying a bill and he says, I need to see every bill. Well, the only reason he might need to see every bill is to make sure they're legitimate bills. But after you've gotten through all that, he might say you can sign off on anything above five out uh, below five thousand dollars and or you can decide what accountant we're going to use. You can decide these things. You might make a list of things in advance and say, if I came into this business, here's how I'd run it. And I want to know that you're comfortable with this. And if you are not comfortable with this, then I suggest we find somebody else who could do this work for you. And then I'm going to go and offer these same services to other people, obviously not competitors of yours, but other people who could utilize me. And maybe you end up starting a business using your husband first. And then you start developing an, uh, people that could work for you on a part-time basis. And then they uh, work with your husband. And then you find the next business and the next business and just keep replacing yourself with part-time people to go and work with other contractors in a variety of fields because you've developed a process and methodology for it. But with your husband, you know his strengths and weaknesses. You know your own strengths and weaknesses you know what you can go and agree on and disagree on you know if he's a micromanager and if he is that might not work out for you because you don't want to be micromanaged it could be uh that uh in terms of having a day-to-day -day relationship as a husband and wife you are fine talking about the kids and what you're going to do for your trips and you might have some common hobbies that you get to do together but when you actually have to physically work together then that be, be, it might be too much because now it's 24-7 with that person. And that could be uh, a deal breaker in terms of how you as a couple can function. So again, you know what you're like as a couple. You know how much of a risk tolerance that you can take working together. And what you have to do is write everything out, have an honest discussion, say, look, the most important thing to us is making sure our marriage is successful and that our family is safe. The second thing we want to do is make sure that your business is protected, that you're able to do what you love doing, and maybe even 
increase what you're doing and bring other people in to do it and build a bigger business. So you also have to find out from your husband, what's his objective? Is he happy just with 250,000 a year? Or does he have an objective that he'd like to be a two or $3 million business with people doing this all over your region and maybe uh, beyond? So again, sit down, think about it, have an honest conversation about it. And don't feel obligated that you need to get involved in his business. And he shouldn't feel obligated that he needs to bring you into that business. Again, your marriage is the most important thing and your family. Next question is from Ashley Lay uh, Torno. I think I pronounced that correctly. Ashley asked, any advice on setting prices for different services and niches you service? I own a residential and commercial cleaning company. Residential, I charge $35 an hour plus HST. Commercial, depending on office size, I normally charge $55 per hour plus HST. Major box doors, uh, major box doors, I charge $0.40 per square foot uh, per visit. My friend the other day asked me to give a quote to his boss. Going in, I thought it was one store once a week, finding out that was three stores every day of the week. This threw my pricing out of whack and I didn't know how to charge. I already shot him a quote. Definitely think I lowballed myself. Wondering how can I finalize and structure my pricing better? I like to put together, and if I were you, I would put together a spreadsheet that goes and shows how many people would take to do the job, how long it would take, how much per hour that you pay these people and get a sense of all of that. Because if you put all that into a spreadsheet, you put the time to drive there, you put all of the materials that you need, you have to put in um, a sliver for your website cost, you know, everything, every expense that goes into running your business, you should put it all into a spreadsheet and then determine what percentage is allocated to this. Now, obviously, the people who are working on it, they're they're $10, $15 an hour, whatever you're paying folks, that's going to be allocated by hour and it's 100% of it. But if you have a bookkeeper who has to set up the billing for this, then whatever uh, time it takes them to do it, then you put that hourly number in. And, And you have to put all of that stuff in to figure out what your total costs are going to be. And then I'm sure you're wanting to add a 20, 25% margin to it. But I love putting together spreadsheets and making sure I've included every cost. Just this morning, I had uh, was coaching a business that's doing exactly what you're doing. And I sent her a spreadsheet that I did for a contractor showing all the different things that this contractor has to do, things he didn't even think about charging uh, for. You know, for instance, you know, uh, the distance it took to drive to get to the client. The fact that for this contractor, they had to get permits and the time it took to get the permits and all the wrangling back and forth. So you have to include all of that in the time. And if a client, if if after you've done this and you've put what minimum margin uh, that you want on this particular uh, client, of course, if you get this client and you can show you could do three stores every day, then that probably opens up a lot of other opportunities for you as well to get other stores who could utilize you. But after you've put all of that together, you can't lose money on anything. It just doesn't make sense for you to go and lose money. So if he gives you a price that you just say financially, I just can't do it, then you have to walk away from it because clearly you've got other business opportunities. There's lots of business in this particular space out there. True, there's a lot of competition, but At the end of the day, there's no point in being in business if you're going to lose money unless you said to yourself, I want to be in chain stores and I don't mind making a small amount of money or even breaking even just to show that I could do it to go and get more clients. And and of course, you can always go back to him after you've gotten others and renegotiate your deal. But that's what I would do if I were you is create that spreadsheet, understand all of your costs, understand how much time this is going to take. And of course, if he's giving you work every day, he's looking at some kind of discount because he's buying a sense in volume of your time. 
But that being said, you've got, if your people are working every day for you and it's not a different crew, and now you've got to start paying benefits and all the taxes that go along with it, well, now you've got to include that all into your pricing to figure out what that's going to be. And you're probably not going to want to have to deal with the governmental issues of paying people under the table and taking that particular risk. So again, put that spreadsheet together, get all your costs uh, aligned, figure out what that is and figure out what's the, I say, not gross margin, but net margin you want to end up with at the end of the day. How much do you want to make off of any of these things? Because maybe on a one-off deal, you're looking to make 25, 30%, but maybe on this consistent income deal that they're signing a contract and you know they're good at paying and they pay you um, within 30 days, you're not being held out 60, 90, 120 days to get paid then you might be saying, you know what? I'd be comfortable with a 20% margin. Okay, our next question is from Nicole Batiste. Nicole asked, is there a checklist for lack of a better word I can use to make sure I'm covering all uh, basis as I start a partnership with a complementary business? I'm a life habit strategist and help clients create better habits that lead to permanent weight loss, better eating habits, better morning and evening routines, stress and anxiety reduction, better sense of self and trust. I'm partnering with a local fitness person as I do not have a fitness component to my program. We're creating a separate business name and will conduct workshops and programs that incorporate both of our services. That means payment could either go to each of us separately for a joint gig or we can create a separate PayPal or something for joint payments. I know there's a bunch of legal things to consider. Just want a place to start. Thank you. Okay, so this is kind of a part. This is a somewhat complicated and uncomplicated at the same time. The good news is you each offer separate things, so that's great. I'm sure this fitness person would love for you to be able to send them business. So you have to take a look at yourself and say, do you have potential clients you can send them? But if he's saying, hey, I've got lots of clients that could utilize you, then maybe you're just paying him a percentage off of each of these clients. And maybe when you each refer each other business, each of you gets a taste of that business. Because if you're doing most of the work, then you should get most of the profit. So maybe if you're just making up, charging $100 an hour for what you do, and he sends you a client, maybe you're giving him $20 out of that $100 an hour because you didn't have to do anything to go get that client. He sent it to you and it's enough money that makes it interesting for him. And now as an ongoing, he keeps getting money from that client. So in a year, if you did $10,000 worth of consulting, and he got $2,000, that's pretty nice because all he had to do was make the introduction and he keeps getting that residual. If you made the introduction to him and he gets a fitness client that he's ongoing and the same thing happens, fantastic. One of you might end up with more clients than the other. That could always happen. And that way you can go and share it. So maybe you don't need to have a partnership with a co corporate name. Maybe it's just a referral partnership, but if you decide you're going to go into a legal partnership, well, then you want to write out everything. Who's going to do what from marketing to sales for how referrals work, how you get paid for referring. So if you refer him three clients, but he refers you nothing, does he get all the money from those new clients or do you get a percentage? If you give, he gives you clients and he gets nothing, how does that work? So I think it's best that you write out all of those things, how each of you are going to help market the other person to help them get new business. How is the handoff going to work? Who actually owns the client? Because a lot of times when people send clients to a strategic partner, they want to make sure they continue to own that client and are the interface with that client. Maybe you don't want to have that person as the interface that they just send it to you. And you, of course, keep them in the loop about what you're doing as long as it doesn't interfere with the confidentiality of the relationship, especially if you're talking about stress factors and other 
personal issues. So again, what I would do is I'd write out uh, in writing an agreement and not just do it verbally and have each of you agree to it and then sign it. And then you might go to a lawyer and, and have them look at it and say, is there anything missing here? How do we protect each other? How do we make sure that the other person is fairly treated? And if there's a disagreement, you should have a third party or, or uh, bring someone in who will listen to both sides and then help make a decision about what would uh, work best in terms of resolving that particular problem. But again, in the beginning, I would just start up with a simple referral agreement. If they refer you business, there's what they get. If he refers you business, this is what you get. So that's what I would do to start with and see how you work together. I wouldn't go into a formal legal partnership until you've seen for three to six months how you work together as a team. Because once you get into that legal, then you've got some state issues, some federal issues. You're going to need to talk to a lawyer. You're going to have some talk, tax consequences with it, how you're filing your taxes. But if you just do a written agreement as a strategic partner, each of you having your own separate business, I think that's going to be cleaner. And that's what I would do in the beginning until you saw this thing was like, oh my God, it's going gangbusters. We're making a lot of money doing this maybe we want to expand and therefore maybe we're going to have a different type of business here that we each own. So that's what I would do in that particular case. Our next uh, question is from Simon uh, Marta Giglio. Simon asks, can it be profitable to run a food truck business in Switzerland in the high summer season this year? If so, what would be the correct analysis that should be done and then the corresponding business plan? I live in a very touristy city in Switzerland, where it's also close to other highly touristy cities. I have experience in food trucks and cooking meats. The, uh, this, the idea would be to make a food truck with Argentinian food. Sounds delicious. Can you please park out front of my building? I would love to have that different types of meats and sandwiches and other things like empanadas, hot dogs. Since I'm Argentinian and my family, we have a butcher shop and cooking events there. So the idea would be basically copy the copy these businesses from Argentina to Switzerland, starting with a food truck. One, I don't know about the culture of Switzerland because I've never been to Switzerland, but you should find out how are tr food trucks received there. Are there a lot of food trucks there? Because I haven't seen food trucks in, in some of the countries I've been to. And I guess I've been to about 40 countries in my life. So not every country has them. Some people uh, in their culture don't believe in eating food trucks. They have a preconceived notion about the quality of the food of a food truck. So I'd find out how do people in Switzerland like that? Maybe you would even want to survey people and find out what they think. Have they eaten at food trucks in other countries? Is that something that would be cool? My daughter had a friend that started a bagel shop in Sweden, and that thing took off like wildfire, uh, wildfire because people had had bagels in the States, and when she opened up, the people would have them before, said, oh my God, that's awesome. She made great bagels, and then they told people, and it kind of took off. So you might also have to find out do these towns allow for food trucks on the street or do they look at them as unsightly or it takes up space? How is food trucks viewed there? Have you talked to the government and find out, can you get a license to do a food truck in, in Switzerland? So there's a lot of things that you're going to have to find out before you even start this. And maybe it would be a good idea for you to write out a business plan for this, but I'd find out, is it legal? Will the culture like it? If, in fact, it's legal, the culture like it, then I'd have to find out what location would I put it at that would really do very, very well and attract a lot of businesses. Because like in uh, the United States, I live in Philadelphia, we, we are like one of the food truck capitals. And so we have lots of food trucks on college campuses because it's inexpensive. The kids like to eat fast. We also have a lot of food trucks where um, businesses uh, like law firms, accounting firms, any kind of professional service firms are, 
because people are taking a quick break. They run outside. They go to the Chinese food truck, the halal food truck, whatever it is. They go buy their meal for between five and ten dollars, take it right back up, or they sit outside. So those things work out great. And our city has been doing it. I'm 60 my entire life. There's always been food trucks. So again, look at contact the uh, city you're in, find out what licenses you need, if it's possible to do it. Look at uh, the culture and see if people would actually <clears throat> buy from a food truck and then um, go and figure out what corner you would best um, be successful at and then get rolling. And if you're successful there, there was a guy who sold nuts in Santiago, Chile, and he was so successful uh, that Chileans who moved to New York City said, I would love to open up one of your essentially what they call now pop-up stand, pop-up stands now, but it was just a cart selling peanuts. This guy grew a massive business and I read that he had sold that business just selling uh, coated nuts for $60 million to a private equity firm. So maybe you're on to something here. Maybe you're going to make a lot of money creating and, and be the food truck king for all of Switzerland and then expand throughout Europe. Good luck with that. Our next uh, question comes from Sanel uh, Perviv. If you have some extra cash in business, what would be your next move to grow the business? I'm in the title searching business. We provide B2B services. Our clients are title insurance companies. Interesting. So if you have the extra cash, you'd have to decide do I keep expanding this business and maybe hire another salesperson on to drive more business? Or is there another market with our skill set, our knowledge that we could go into that would complement our business? But if our business went away because of whatever happened with the pandemic, if that affected you negatively, or if there are changes in your industry that would affect you negatively, and you're thinking, I don't want to have all my eggs in that one basket. I certainly wanted to have diverse uh, revenue streams. Now, you could also take that extra money. I worked with a company where the guy per, um, sold specialty marketing uh, products like hats, mugs, and so forth. And every year he took the extra cash and bought another house to rent out. And over a period of 15 years, he essentially bought 35 different houses. And he said, now I make as much money from the rental income from that than I do in my own business. So if my business went away, I would be perfectly fine. So all he did was kept funneling the profits to buy more and more properties. I knew another guy who did the same thing. So you might not take that extra money and funnel it into your existing business, you might start a separately incorporated business and go into something else. I've done that myself. I uh, had Kramer Communications and I was developing marketing, sales, operating plans. And then I decided that I uh, wrote a book on consulting and I created a business called Consulting University USA to teach people how to be consultants. And I invested profits from Kramer into that, I invested profits into another new venture I'm launching called Funding Organizer. So there are different options, but you also, and this is important, you also want to make sure that you have enough cash that if things go wrong, that you can last for a period of time. So for me, I like to have a minimum of cash in my business of six months. So if I didn't get a single dime coming in, I knew I had six months of running money, minimum. I typically like to carry at least a, worth, uh, a year's worth of money in my account. I sleep beautifully knowing that every day I'm a year away from running out of money. That's a really nice thing. Our next uh, question is from Cheston Salisbury. Cheston asks, how can I get better at finding, hiring, engaging resources, people to help me carry my vision forward? so I can finally get out of the business of doing everything for the business, a problem that all entrepreneurs have. I'm trying to build a SaaS uh, platform while trying to keep my existing digital marketing agency afloat just enough to continue generating monthly income, monthly revenue I need. 
I want to get to a point I can either completely offload the digital marketing work or engage others to help build out my SaaS vision. How can I get better at finding, evaluating, delegating all the work that needs to get done? I find myself stuck doing tasks I know I shouldn't be doing, but I've been unable to find or provide sufficient instruction, guidance, structure, resource, people capable of helping. I have the same problems that you do, and here's how I've dealt with it. So when I started a new venture, I went and looked for a partner that could come in with me. He's not a 50-50 partner in equity, but from a revenue standpoint, the share of revenue will be relatively uh, close to being the same. So I went and asked people who would be good at building this product I needed building and are they entrepreneurial? And then when I met with them, would they be willing to come in as a minority partner in the business? And in some cases, I put up some of I put up money for different aspects of what we need. So you didn't have to pull anything out of pocket. And I actually even paid a small amount of money uh, just so I paid them something. But that's how I went about doing it. And in your particular case, do you bring in enough money that you could start to bring people on, have the time to train them? Because in your business, you're working by the hour doing this project for your different clients. And could you take time out of your week and bring somebody on? Now, I would want to bring either somebody who's experienced a part time that could jump in right away or somebody who might be in college or just got out of college and is work, looking for his first job and you can train them and they want to be in that. And maybe over time, as revenue grows, they make more money and maybe over time they could actually become a partner in it. Um, I knew a man who had a janitorial business. He was doing it himself. He had um, a high school kid that joined him. And over time, the business grew so much because he didn't have to do it all that they started hiring other high school kids. And the first high school kid he hired stayed with him for 25 years and he made him not only a partner, but he sold him the business afterwards. But he made sure he gave him the right incentive and all the people that came to work for them, they made sure that they all got bonuses at the end of the year. And so they were getting paid more to do that than they could do something else for somebody who had no college degree. So. One of the things you have to look at is, do you have the time and are you willing to spend the money to train someone else? Because it's going to take time and money because you're not going to be able to do everything you were doing before. And can you find somebody that over time could do all the things and do them well like you are and that you could make money because cash flow was still coming. The guy with the janitorial business ended up owning a gold's gym and then a second gold's gym. So he was getting his revenue coming out of uh, his janitorial business. Everybody was happy at very little turnover. And he was able to take that extra money and go and invest. So maybe you want to do is build this first business up as quickly as possible and add people on who could go and do the work. Or if you can't wait, you either hire a contractor to go build what you want to get built or find a partner who could go and do that. And it could work in reverse where you find that partner to go with your business and you focus as much, if not full time on your SaaS uh, business. But that's what I would do if I were you is to do that. But the hardest part is when that money is coming in, you're really not sure. Do I really want to share that money? I mean, do I really, it doesn't make more sense for me just to do these things. I mean, shit, I could go and work 80 hours in a week. But maybe you're saying to yourself, I don't want to work 80 hours in a week. I really want to get down to where I'm working 60 hours and 50 optimally. So again, you have to weigh all of those kinds of things. Well, everybody, it was great speaking to all of you who have asked those great, amazing questions. I, I got a lot out of it. I hope everybody that was listening it said to themselves, boy, that's something I'm going through. And that answer was helpful to me and what I'm thinking about doing myself. So I hope you all have a great, safe weekend. I hope all of you are able to get your shots, your families are safe, and that soon enough, I think by midsummer, we'll be returning to what we consider normal 
going to baseball games and picnics and barbecues and all the great things that we typically do in the summer throughout the world. Everybody have a great weekend. Take care.